in being asked to talk about race after you've written a book, you're supposed to have the answers, oh. right? You're supposed to have the solution. And while you're having the solution, you're supposed to cater to the emotional needs of the people who are listening to you. Let's talk about it, please. <laughs> right. Welcome to the South Bank Centre podcast. Come with us on a journey to explore where arts and culture meet the gender agenda, politics, identity and economics, where we'll bring you discussion and debate from this year's WOW, Women of the World 2018 Festival. In this podcast, we're bringing you the award-winning novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie in conversation with fellow feminist author Rene Edo Lodge. If you couldn't get tickets or just want to relive the experience, then sit back and enjoy. I'm Jude Kelly. I'm the founder of the WOW movement. Um, And we're having such exciting times, all of us, aren't we? I mean, the world is changing very quickly and we intend to accelerate it. Part of what WOW is trying to do all around the world is connect the stories of girls and women all around the world and make us understand that if we listen, if we listen to stories that aren't ours, then we really will be better placed to try to work out what a different world could look like. Because it won't be like the world we would model all on our own it would be a different kind of place. And so that's an exciting thing, but it does require us to do, I think, a lot of listening from a lot of different places. And that's what we're here to do tonight with Chimamanda and Rennie, because both of them, in their very profound and important ways, are contributing not just to the great pool of literature, but also to the great philosophy of contemporary living. And so we're lucky to have them in conversation for the first time together. So, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie grew up in Nigeria. Her work has been translated into 30 languages. She's the author of the novels Purple Hibiscus, which won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, Half of a Yellow Sun, which won the Orange Prize, and was a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist and a New York Times notable book, and Americana, which won... <laughs> which won the National Book Critics Circle Award and was named one of the New York Times' best 10 best books of 2013. She's the author of the story collection, The Thing Around Your Neck. And her 2012 talk, We Should All Be Feminists, has started a worldwide conversation. What do you reckon? Do you think we've got a few fans in the house? I don't know. <laughs> Just a thought. Her most recent book, Dear Ajiowele, or A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions, designed to come out and has come out on International Women's Day this year, March the 8th. Then she is going to be in conversation with Rennie Edo Lodge. They go into the ring together. She is a London-based award-winning journalist, and she is the winner of the MHP 30 to Watch Award and was chosen as one of the top 30 young people in digital media by The Guardian in 2014. She's been listed in Elle's 100 Inspirational Women list and The Roots 30 Black Viral Voices Under 30. She's contributed to the Good Immigrant Collection. Why I'm no longer talking to white people about race... is her first book. Her paperback version of that, with a new chapter about how her hardback was received, was also published deliberately on the 8th of March, International Women's Day. And they're both... They're both amazing women, and it's absolutely my privilege to have been here standing and telling you about their achievements. I'm so pleased to welcome them both to the stage. Here they are. A standing ovation before we've said a word. That is, <laughs> that's not quite intense. <laughs> Thank you for having us. First of all, it's an honour to be here speaking to you all and also speaking to Chimamanda, one of my favourite fiction authors. But also thank you to WOW Festival and be invited to be in conversation with you because um, I feel this is a festival I've really grown with. <laughs> So it's really exciting today to um, be speaking to you, Chimamanda. I think there are some themes of our work that really overlap. I was telling Chimamanda backstage that many years ago when I was a blogger, I would get invited to go and be a talking head on television. And, and one day I did that and uh, somebody wrote on my Facebook wall. They said to me, 
You really remind me of uh, the protagonist of this novel uh, that I, I've really enjoyed called Americana. Like, yeah, you should, you should definitely read that book. <laughs> and that was how I um, got into your work. <laughs> Are you, are you a bit freaked out by that? <laughs> no, actually, I, I kind of agree with that person. And I'm, now I'm going to call you Femelo from now okay. on. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> I actually went on your website, Chimamanda, and I um, looked at Femelo's blog. Yes, Femelo's blog for me was a device. It was very deliberate and quite strategic. I wanted to say things about race. I wanted to say them without having them be clouded in this thing called nuance, which for me often on the subject of race is a way of not being honest and truthful. And I knew that writing about race in America required nuance. And I would read these books that were ostensibly about race and half the time you weren't sure what was going on, you weren't sure things weren't said, things were so subtle as to be unrecognizable. I just had all these observations. I'd been living in the U.S. for maybe 10 years, and I just really had things to say. And so I thought, how can I get those things in the book? And I thought about having my character be a newspaper columnist, but then I thought, mm, she's going to have an editor who will take those things out. Yeah. So that's what's happened to me, yep. Yep. The editors <laughs> take, out, <laughs> they take out the most interesting things. Yep. And then I thought, here's, here's what blogging, blogging those, and, and this is sort of when blogs were still, you know, a novelty. And there's, there's an immediacy to blogging that I thought would work really well, right? that she's doing this thing, and then you have a platform and you have an audience. And so I thought I would, I would do that. I would use, I mean, most of Ifemelo's opinions and views in that blog are mine. And, you know, I just wanted to talk about, and particularly to talk about race from the point of view of a person who's black but not an American. Mm. Right? And even to, by having that blog, make a point about blackness and the diversity of blackness, right? And also, in some ways, the, the embracing of blackness, if that makes sense. Because I didn't think of, of myself as black until I went to the U.S. In Nigeria, I didn't need to think of myself as black. Right, but it's true, I mean, we, we have many, many problems in Nigeria. Just race, in that sense, is not one of them. So in Nigeria, we're busy saying, you Ibo, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't do race. And, and I went to the U.S. and suddenly I was black. And, and it really was a learning experience for me because I had come from a place where authority figures were black, where black achievement was normal. And in the U.S. to realize that black achievement was seen as remarkable and extraordinary, the Nigerian part of me that thought it was so stupid. Because mm. right? <laughs> I was just like, really? <laughs> right? yeah. But it was also for me a way of, I had to confront my ignorance. I, I didn't know very much about African-American history. And so I started to read. And initially, I didn't want to be black. I didn't want to be identified as black because I knew that black in America came with baggage. And I remember the story which I like to tell because for me, it's, it's um, an example of my complicated feelings as a black immigrant but also, I think, an indictment of racism. This man in Brooklyn, in a store, said to me, his sister, and my first reaction was to recoil, and I was thinking, I'm not your sister. I have three brothers, I know where they are. <laughs> this was maybe a few weeks into my being in the US, and years later, I thought about that, and I, I, it made me feel ashamed and sad, but also I thought it was an indictment. Why was I running away from blackness? Mm. You know, if blackness is benign, and I, I had been in the US for what, six weeks, and I didn't want that, because I could tell, I watched the evening news. I mean, I, you know, I, but reading made me start to learn, and reading made me embrace this new identity, because that's what it was, and identify with it. And, and while, of course, recognizing that my not being a descendant of slaves made my experience different. But with the blog, I wanted to say things that I had observed living, living in the US. And many things that I find infuriating, but some things that are very funny. I mean, the, the thing about <laughs> racism is that some of it is just so dumb. Yep. <laughs> I'm very unimaginative. I mean, really. Yes. <laughs> so I wanted to, I wanted to have a chance to say those things. I remember my editor, when I sent out the first draft, she was like, um, do you think we could have a bit more nuance? <laughs> oh, great. And I was like, no. Mm. You moved to the US when you were 19. Yes. To study. Yeah. I think it's really interesting what you say about blackness because what I pick up from Femelu's blog is a 
blackness as an imposition, as something that is mm. imposed, mm. Uh, different from a burden, but something mm. that is yeah. certainly imposed. Yeah. Is that something that you felt? Yes and no. I think the US forces, and this is a particularly American thing, I think, but maybe it's also the case here. There's a sense in which identity is forced on you. And, and I suppose because of America's history of, of being this place where people came from all over the place, and then identity becomes that you have to have one. Right? And I remember thinking when I, was, when I became black, <laughs> I remember thinking, what if I don't want to be? I mean, there's a choicelessness to it. And so, yeah. so in that sense, it is a kind of imposition. Why does it matter? It matters because it comes with baggage. It matters because my professor in college was surprised that I wrote the best essay. And I knew that his surprise was real simply because I was black. It matters because I know that there are immediate assumptions made by people when they look at me. And there's something about it that is, in fact, an imposition. I often like to say that the problem isn't blackness, obviously, not this, right? Not having this glorious shade of skin. <laughs> the problem, it's true, I, you know, because I really do. <laughs> I mean, but just, <laughs> but it's true. Though. I mean, just think about it, just, just sort of being objectively, just being objective on a very aesthetic level. Dark skin is gorgeous. <laughs> Right. It is. <laughs> so it is. But so, that, so for me, it's not the problem. The problem is what it means, the social meaning that's given to it. And so that what would be an imposition, yes. But so the, I think it's a fair reading of Ephemera and, and of, mm. of my sense. Because uh, I just really relate to that, yeah. the anger at the imposition, the anger mm. that is imposed. Mm. And what's deeply frustrating is um, that you, I, Ephemeru, the royal we, feel quite frustrated at that imposition and when you yeah. articulate that frustration it's received as oh well why do you only care about that yeah. or this is actually identity politics yeah. this is not this is not the real meat of the issue wow. meanwhile if you are black and interested in the external affairs of the world it, it's wow. not something that you can avoid or ignore yeah you can't so i'm just finishing Renier's really marvelous book that everybody should read and there's a bit, this just reminds me, there's a, there's a little bit that made me laugh, where you write about being with white women at some sort of feminist meeting, and they had these examples of how homogenous it is, the images of women that are used in popular media, and somebody said, what, what do they all have in common? Someone said, oh, they're all slim, and they all have long hair, and you're like, yeah, and they're all white. And, <laughs> which I thought was funny. and then the white woman who said, they all, they all have long hair, and you said to her, well, you could grow your hair out if you wanted to, but I can't change the color of my skin, oh, I can't. which I thought was really interesting because I thought it was very telling. In some ways, that, that is the problem. That's, it's that you have this thing that you cannot change, and it's weighted with social meaning that you did not make. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you attempt to navigate it, uh, yeah. you, uh, people say, oh, well, you're obsessed. Focus same. on other things <laughs> I, if you want to I, get ahead in yeah. life. Yeah. I have a friend who would say you, you have to be careful not to be seen as a race warrior. What did you say to your friend? <laughs> I can't say it here. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on that topic of yeah. being careful, I think that you're in a really interesting position because you are, I think, one of, one of the best fiction authors contemporary going right now. I think Good we can all agree ego. on that. And, uh, <laughs> I think it's quite interesting what happens to your public profile as a writer, which you write such gorgeous writing about a number of different things, but you are often corralled into this space um, to speak on race. Mm. I mean, here you are with a writer who wrote a whole book about race. I'm a non-fiction author. I want to out there attacking current affairs. You're about love and oh, wow. <laughs> human relationships and like gorgeous character development. And does it frustrate you that you are corralled into that space? Sometimes, yeah. I do want to talk about things I care about. Mm -hmm. So I think some fiction writers don't much want to talk about social issues, and I think that's fine. You know, some people just want to sort of focus on the art. I've always been a very political person. As a child, I was very interested. So there's a part of me that likes the opportunity to talk about the things I care about. I care about race, I care about gender in particular. But there are times when I deeply resent my work being read as anthropology. I think this I happens think, to you know, fiction writers who are not white yes. all the time. Actually, I think it also happens to women in some ways, where your fiction is often read to be some sort of autobiographical reveal, 
it can be very annoying. Sometimes I do interviews and they want to turn everything and make it about race or make it about feminism. So, I mean, if, I, if a character takes a glass of water, they're like, but wasn't that a feminist glass of water? <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, no, it was just a glass of water. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I am a person who's very interested in, I want to talk about love and human emotion and, and how complex it is and how flawed we are as people. And there's a sense in which talking about race and gender is ideological and it's almost the opposite of, of fiction, right? Because fiction is is uncertain and human, and ideology is firm and sure. Mm. It then means having to st strike this balance where I do want to talk about race, but also right, I want to talk about how Ephemeral is flawed and how she doesn't have all the answers, and how, um, how no, not all the white people in the book are racist, and how, you know, that sort of thing. It, mm. it just, it can become, it can become exhausting. I totally agree. I think it's a terrible thing that happens to Fiction authors who are not white, their, their books are held up as like, this is going to explain yep. this moment in the yep. world. Yep. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Like, fiction, which I love, can be a wonderful vehicle for yeah. empathy. Yeah. But and and fiction can explain, but the point is that fiction doesn't have to explain. It shouldn't have to explain. Mm. There are people... <laughs> I have a friend um, who wrote a book who's Asian, and, and he said to me that it's so interesting how... He wrote a book that really had nothing to do with what was being talked about at a dinner party he went to. And they turned to him and they're like, you people eat cats and dogs, don't you? Oh. And, and he'd written a book about this man who's an entrepreneur. And, mm. and I just remember thinking there's a disconnect because often you're looked at and people see what you represent. They're not really seeing you. And, and I think that's one of the things that if you're white, you don't ever have to deal with. White people get to be individuals. Yeah, you, yes. You, yes, you don't have to represent. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's another question that I think is quite interesting because you said that talking about race and, and gender can be seen as ideology, I think particularly yeah. in these polarised times. Yeah. But I think what you do with your work is you weave it into the... You weave these issues, these uncertainties, into just the natural flow of a human being's life, mm, which yeah. I know that's certainly where I started. You know, when I wrote that initial blog post, mm. it was... Uh, it was just a scream <laughs> into, uh, yeah. into the void of human interaction that wasn't going very well, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know, I just think that's really difficult yeah. to... I mean, I think you do an amazing job of letting people know this is part of life. This isn't, yeah. I'm, a, I'm part of this political sect, and so I yeah. think this, you know? But it is part of life. I mean, the, the mm. reality of, of people's lives... I, mean, I don't think that politics is something that's apart from us. I don't think that we, and sometimes when people tell me, talk about your feminism, it's not like I put on my feminist hat. It's who I am, mm. you know? And I don't choose on some days to be black and on some days to be a woman. I'm both, and both interact. So there's a sense in which I think that to be a black person in the world, particularly in, in what is called the West, is to constantly negotiate blackness. You know, if you walk into a store and somebody's rude to you, you're thinking, this person is having a bad day, that's a, a possibility. This person is just an asshole, that's a possibility. <laughs> this person is racist, right? Is being rude to me because I'm black. Those are three options, right? If you're, if you're a white person, if you're a white person and somebody's rude to you in the store, you just have the two options, bad day or asshole. You don't have the third one. Mm. <laughs> so that for me is simply a way of saying it is part of people's lives. When I talk about ideology, it's more to say that there's a sense in which in, in being asked to talk about race after you've written a book, you're supposed to have the answers, oh. right? You're supposed to have the solution. And while you're having the solution, you're supposed to cater to the emotional needs of the people who are listening to you. Let's talk about it, please. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Let's talk so. about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have all of this... Your this has been my year. <laughs> How do you deal with that? Because being seen as a representative, yeah. I know I get this, I'm sure you get this as well. Uh, people sort of come up to you and project their anxieties and fears. How do you deal with that? Give me some advice, please. <laughs> oh, I just... I, I, I smile, I put on my sunglasses and I walk away. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> no, it's... Do you know, I mean, it, <laughs> really, sometimes I do that. But, I, but also, I, I try to remember, you know, there's something to be said for remembering the humanity of people. A lot of these people are, are themselves anxious, uncertain. They're coming from 
fear. And I try to remember that, you know, especially when my irritation threatens to take over, which it often does. But there are times I make a concerted effort to remember that. You know. My thing is to be honest. If you're projecting things on me that I don't believe, I will tell you I don't, you know, I don't agree. I don't believe that. Mm. People who've said to me, you know, but in the end, we're all really the same. And I keep saying, but that's not the point. The fact that I'm a fiction writer, I'm a, literature is my religion. So of course I know that there's a universality in being human. And I Speaking deeply books. believe in that. Yes, that's the, you know, I grew up reading books from Russia and from India, everyone, I love them. But, you know, we can acknowledge the universality of being human and also acknowledge that there are differences that affect our lives in different ways. I mean, I think that people are so uncomfortable about that, that they start to go into this whole, yeah, but really, in the end, we're all the same, or, or really, we shouldn't focus on the negative, or... Uh, I sometimes lie to people when I'm, like, out and about, like, in the gym or something, and they're like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a teacher. Like. <laughs> Because I can't be dealing with your fears and anxieties right now. I'm a cab driver. I'm literally anything. I. You no, know. I'm going to make you a T-shirt. I'm going to make you a T-shirt, Renny, which says, "Yes, I'm the person who wrote why I'm no longer talking to white people about race." There's something about. There's a lot about the book that I think really just. I hate to use the word triggered. I feel it's been overused. Oh, in I just that world. word so much. I'm but sorry. It, let's say it flips a, t a switch of But I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In, yeah, um, yeah. And sometimes people seek me out on social media to tell me about the book that they haven't read, that I've written, um, <laughs> and their opinions and feelings about it. <laughs> and so when you spoke of irritation, I was thinking, you're not on social media. No, I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. do it. Yeah, I can't. Is it because you're, you feel irritated? For, or? I just can't. I just can't. Mm. It's, not, it's not, you know, I think some people are suited to, to these media things. Some people mm. are not. I am not. Would I, you advise me to step away? Because I would. Yeah? I would. That's an I mean, exclusive people. Um. You know what? But, but also, it, it, when I think about people who are very active, I just think, when do you get the time to write? It's so yeah. true. I mean, as soon as it, I started it, writing yeah. the book, I checked out of social media, yeah. basically. I couldn't do it as well because I'm not a person who knows how to let go. You know, I would, yeah. <laughs> I, so, so actually Michelle said to me, it's such a good thing you're not on Twitter. She said, because I'll spend all my time extracting you from the fights you would get. <laughs> <laughs> because I want to set people straight about oh, yeah. this way. I know it so But also much. there's something, I think there is something, um, social media can be useful, but I think it has, there's an undertone of just ugliness. People say things they would never say to you. Sometimes things they don't really believe. I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on any of that, but they send emails to my manager. Wow. Yeah. What do they say? Oh, do you Lord. care to divulge? <laughs> Some, do you know actually the, the piece that got the most things? That I wrote a piece about Michelle Obama. Right. In which I celebrated a woman who I think to be extraordinary. And I got, I mean, we, we got, we got emails that I was just really taken aback. And I remember thinking, if I'm getting these for writing about her, I don't know the crap she's had to deal mm. with. I mean, there were emails that, you know, this person, there was one email, the subject was Mooshell. She's a cow. You support a cow, therefore you're a cow. I mean. <laughs> and clearly, unimaginative. And seriously, and, and obviously written by a, what I, I supposed to be a grown man. Oh, unimaginative. <laughs> It's quite boring, I think, to mm. receive racial abuse that is just like so pedestrian. Yeah. And then you think, really, honestly, you, it would be nice if they were a little bit more inventive, yeah. right? Come on, mix it up. But I hear this all the time. <laughs> I mean, I get a lot of, like, not a lot. I mean, I don't, I don't want to exaggerate and make it. I don't get a lot, but I do get some. When it's from Africans, they say things like, you're destroying marriages, you're, you're you know. <laughs> when it, you know, yeah. That is ridiculous. <laughs> so no, but Renny, so just one, just go before on, you go. So, so back to the idea of managing the feelings of people to whom you're talking, because in some ways, who's who's the audience of your book? Okay, so I have two audiences. I've yeah. split them into two camps. I have the people for whom this is speaking to something that I've always wanted to say. Yeah. And um, yeah. I'm like. That's incredible. Yeah. And I'm so glad that my work has provided these people with a tool. And then I have the people who say, this book has completely changed my mind. And then they say, I had an argument with so-and-so about it, my dad, my auntie, my uncle. And then they tell me what their uncle and auntie and dad said. 
the weird racist things. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if you got that initial essay where I was like, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> like I, was, I felt I was quite clear, like clarity is <laughs> clarity is very important to me. Um, you, you may have guessed if you've read the book, yes. uh, I love a definition. I love to look at the dictionary. Some people aren't hearing it when I say, I don't want to hear that anymore, please. Yeah. So well, we've got two camps. Yeah. Why do you ask? But because I'm thinking about that whole idea of managing, being responsible for the emotional response of your readers, by which I mean your white readers. And so if you have somebody who bursts into tears... That <laughs> happened <laughs> this time last year at the event I did for an event I did for the book. Somebody did burst into tears who was white. Because she felt bad. She did feel bad. About the terrible racism in the world. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's, I think, and, and I said this, no, right, I, I should be more, no, seriously, to be, to be a bit more serious, because I remember once watching this TV show and somebody was talking about racism. Oh, it was Trayvon Martin, when Trayvon Martin was murdered. And this white woman started to cry. And she said she felt really bad and she felt excluded from the conversation. <laughs> and I, I honestly, I really, but here's the thing. I was genuinely puzzled. And you know, I'm, I'm, no, but really, honestly, I was. Because I'm a believer in stories. I think of, I think, I want to try and understand people's motivations and that sort of thing. So I remember thinking, why is she crying? She's crying because there were black women who were talking about Trayvon Martin and there's women who were talking about the talk. You know, when African Americans talk about having to tell their kids that be careful because the police will not treat you in the same way as they would treat somebody who's not black. And she starts crying and saying she feels excluded. And I remember thinking, maybe what we need to do before we talk about race is pass around um, little... <laughs> I'm just making this up as I go along. But we should, I'm here for it. We should have people, we should pass sort of little vials of a powder that neutralizes stupidity. <laughs> right? So, no, 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 I'm being unkind. I'm being unkind. No, I take it back. I take it back. Here's what I mean. What I mean really is, is a powder that neutralizes that idea that it's about you. Oh, God. You know? It needs to happen. I, no, seriously, because I think, and also... Because I think, no, but really, and, and I mean that... <laughs> Let the woman speak, people. No, I really mean that, because I really think that we do have to find a way to understand one another. Because Absolutely. otherwise, there's no point, right? And so to do that, maybe if we say, because I think that often, in talking about race, white people take it as an affront, as a personal affront. It's something I need to defend myself. And maybe it's a good thing to start by saying, and I can understand if it's an annoying thing for black people to have to do, because they're thinking, look, I'm dealing with racism, and now I have to start off by telling you, I'm not saying you did anything to me. Mm -hmm. But maybe, <laughs> maybe because I keep thinking to myself, you know, how do we actually get people to hear? I, I really I, think yeah. that there's something in the water of whiteness that makes it, that, that's drunk, you know, you drink it by virtue of being white, and it just makes you think that any talk of racism is, is about you. Mm -hmm. My question is, in that defensiveness, mm -hmm. I, I'm so interested. It's like, what is that white person, this hypothetical white person we're speaking about, so invested in? Because usually, it's largely unexamined anyway. Yeah. So why are you it, defending it so much? The ways in which I try to understand it is think about the positions of privilege that I occupy. And it's class. Right. So gender, I, I didn't win the lottery. Um, race, didn't win the lottery either. But, and can I just say I would not change anything. I'm so happy to be a black woman in the world, right? <laughs> Honestly. So whatever. But, but class, class, I occupy a position of privilege. And I have from birth. So I grew up in a family that, that was, you know, educated, upper middle class. We had help. I had, it was a privileged life. And I think about that to try and understand whiteness. And it kind of helps. Because I think about how when people talk about, how I have to acknowledge that my ability to have help, for example, in Nigeria, is based on a privilege that I really haven't earned. And it's based on a system that makes it possible. And that if people are talking about, oh, all those people who have house helps and have drivers, how do I feel about it? I feel defensive. There's just always that ever so slight prickle of defensiveness. And I, which is also why I'm very keen to tell people what a good employer I am. 
So Are it's you a always good I, just, I am actually. Good. <laughs> good, good. But then, but this is also how a white person would be like, well, I'm not racist. Hmm. Racism exists, but I'm personally not. So it kind of helps me understand that, right? And, and so when people talk about privilege and class inequality, most of which makes me angry and I feel bad about it, but I, but I also have to admit that I'm happy benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a way to understand that maybe, maybe that defensiveness is that there's a sense in which whiteness as a structure thinks that acknowledging racism means that the easy life of whiteness in the whiteness bubble will disappear. Which, in, indeed, which, it does not go. It doesn't leave even it, once you say, oh, it, I've got it. Right? Mm. It really doesn't. There's a question I want to ask you. I've been rereading your work, and a theme that I picked up was... Um, so in my, li in my book, I've got this line, whiteness is an occupying force of the mind. That comes straight from, like, Franz Fanon. And one thing that I picked up strongly reading... Um, your collection of short stories, Purple Hibiscus in particular, is the, um, the colonial overhang of white missionaries in Nigeria mm. and how mm. it continues to occupy Nigerians' minds. Yeah. Uh, both, his, you know, you explore it historically. It's quite destructive and ugly in Purple Hibiscus with yeah. Campbell's dad. Yeah. And then um, in a more contemporary way in Americana, you know, that conversation about the best school to send your child to. I wondered if you wanted to speak yeah. a little bit more about that. I, I never pass up on an opportunity to rib a certain kind of Nigerian who thinks that everything foreign is, is just better. You know, it's funny listening to you say that because I think it, it must be something that occupies me quite a bit because apparently I write about it a lot. There's a part of me obviously comes from a, from a sadness and an anger at how present our history still is. So we talk about colonialism as something that happened not only does it shape the shapeless form of our government, <laughs> I, think, I think that Nigeria and I think that all of the countries that were colonized in Africa were not set up to succeed. And so the expectation that you, you survive, I mean really, you know, the, I think the expectation that you survive colonialism and then go on to flower into this wonderful democracy, it doesn't make sense, right? Absolutely. Colonialism was a dictatorship. So it's not surprising that these countries haven't done well. But there's also, I think, that the extent of the failure is something that we have to take responsibility for. Because I think that, you know, if we had governors who stole a little less money, we might be a little better, right? But, so that said, so there's that, but there's also what it's done to our minds. And that's what, that's what I'm saddest about. And it's an occupier. It, Once it's a physical there. occupier, now a mental yep. one, for yep. sure. It's Absolutely. there. It's there because we're not teaching our children our languages. And not only are we not teaching them our languages, we're telling them that we've shrouded the idea in shame. So it's uncool, right? And it's remarkable when you do speak your language. Mm. So you become the person who's, oh, you speak Igbo well, when I'm thinking, actually, it should be the reverse. But it's also the way that we think about the things that are native to us. We actually, we use the language of the colonizer. It's everywhere. I read fashion things in Nigeria, and they actually use the word tribal to describe, I mean, and I'm just thinking how, so you, you borrow the language of other people and use it mm. for yourself. It's such a strange thing. Mm. I mean, it's either that we're all going to leave Nigeria, <laughs> right? or we have to figure out how to make it work. But, but really, it's, colonialism is there in the way we think about ourselves. It's so present, and I find it, I find it quite poisonous. Yeah. There's a debate raging in literature, in literary circles, yeah. and has been going for some time. I'm sure you're aware of it about cultural appropriation, who can yeah. write what story. The author, Lionel Shriver, is, um, she's been spearheading yeah. this suggestion that political correctness is killing literary freedom. And she said, I'm um, just quoting directly, I have plenty of recent experience of using non-white characters in my novels, only to have them singled out and scrutinized for thought crime. If even writers like me are starting to wonder if including other ethnicities and races in our fiction is worth the potential blowback, then fiction is in serious trouble. And she also pinpointed um, this phenomenon that appears to be happening in the US at the moment, sensitivity readers, where somebody looks at your manuscript and says, mm, that's a bit of a racist portrayal, isn't it? Mm. I mean, what do you think of this literary debate? I don't write fiction, but yeah. I'm a political writer. It's quite a political conversation. I'm paying attention. I'm feeling quite yeah. agitated. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Well, I can tell you that I do not want to have a sensitivity reader, and I think the idea of sensitivity readers is terrible. I mm. really do. 
And I understand that it's well-meaning and it comes from a good place, but I think it's terrible for art. Here's why. I really believe in a certain kind of honesty, right? which means that we cannot sugarcoat. I want to know, if you're a racist, I want to know that you're a racist. <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> no, honestly, I do. And, and you know, the, the, it's an interesting thing because on the one hand, I have read books that make me cringe. And I just think, come on, right? This is just really racist and bad. But do I, would I have wanted that writer to have had a sensitivity reader? No. Fiction has to have, I have to believe it. And to believe it, there's a sense in which literature has to start with the premise of being flawed. We're all flawed. I mean, we, we, and so we do have to write about racism. We do have to write, but I suppose the question then is, how do we write about it? There's a, a bit in your book where somebody says, where you write about somebody saying, imagine, oh, I think it was the conversation about um, the MP, Diane Abbott, where oh, there was sort of a lot of noise about what she'd said, and s somebody wrote a piece about, well, imagine if a white person had said that. Well, they're, they're and the majority I, in Parliament, so. But I remember thinking, <laughs> but I remember thinking, but it's not the same thing. I mean, the whole idea is that we should dream about a world in which it will, it is the same thing, but it's not yet. Mm. And so because of that, we can draw those parallels. It's not the same thing. Mm. If a black person said it and a white person said it, it's not the same thing. The ability of a white person to write about people of color is different from, from a person of color writing about a white person because of power. Absolutely. It's not because the black person is better. Well, right? one has uh, spent the entire adult life and probably childhood life reading books about white people and it's not really going the other way other direction is it because uh, <laughs> no sadly know. not also there aren't enough I feel like black, more black writers should be published I think it's also important just to say that why is that right and there's something in your book about people saying well the population of the UK is majority white therefore which in, in a case is true but I think that the representation of blackness in in the cultural um, artifacts that are valued is very small and that feels deliberate. Oh, totally. yeah, it's smaller than it should be. Mm -hmm. right? The question is not to have equal parity. In other words, if you have you know, 70 million white people and you have 10 million black people, then of course you're not going to have equality of production, but I, I think that the, the representation of, of black, and not just blackness, just people who are not white, it's much, much smaller than it should be and that feels deliberate, that feels that's not a good look. 2016 statistics showed that out of the thousands upon thousands of books published in Britain in that year, I think it was less than 100 were published by people who were not white and British, less than 100. We've got not much time left, so we're gonna move on to feminism. Although we've been, we're speaking, we've been speaking about it, none of these things are, it's not a binary. Are you a child of academics, is that correct? Yes. Child of academics. But, but in We Should All Be Feminists, you said that you couldn't stomach the classic feminist texts. No. You couldn't, you couldn't even get through them? No. Why is that? Because they were boring. I see. <laughs> <laughs> they were. So no, I, <laughs> what was your entry point if, if it wasn't the classic feminist texts? To feminism? It was life. It was observing. I was a feminist long before I knew what the word meant which is to say that I, as a child, was very observant, and I noticed very early on, and was very annoyed by the things I couldn't do because I was a girl, and the things boys could do because they were boys. And, and as a child, it didn't make sense to me. And I remember we would go to my ancestral hometown, and it was fun, at Christmas, the masquerades would come out, the children would all run out to go look at the masquerades, and it was so much fun. And then at some point, when the most interesting masquerades would sort of start to emerge, the ones who were considered really evil, like that powers and the smoke coming out of their heads and then they'll say all oh, the girls go inside and I'd be like but that's the best part I mean why mm. <laughs> and they're like oh you know you can't because you're a girl and you know little things like that that the color knot again which is a central part of Igbo culture only men could bless the color knot and if a man a grown adult man wasn't present and women wanted to sort of present the color knot they would find a child a boy to bless it <laughs> and I remember thinking this is so absurd mm. right and, but also just the other things that I was told, oh, you, you have to learn to cook and clean because that's what you're going to do in your husband's house. And I remember thinking, not only do I not want to cook and clean, I don't even want to be in a husband's house. <laughs> and I felt like nobody, no, but it's true. I mean, 
And I felt, I felt very much and very early on that there was something very wrong with this. I felt, I felt very early that this was deeply wrong. And, and not only that, that, but that we needed to change this. And I remember in grade three, my teacher saying, the monitor will be the, the best, if you get the best grade, it will be the monitor. And we took the test, I was the best. This boy Chinese, he was second. And she said, oh, but it has to be a boy. And I, I remember thinking, no, but why? And she said, well, I thought it was obvious, you know, a boy has to be, but then you can be the deputy. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to be the deputy, I want mm. to be the monitor. So it was things of that sort. And also in some ways, reading literature. There's a, a writer called Flora Wapa. Reading Flora Wapa, for example, was very eye-opening for me because it was about Igbo women and their lives. And it, it, so it's not a book that is a classic feminist text, but it is very feminist because- So it should be a classic feminist text? Add it to canon? I do think that a lot of books about women's lives are, in fact, classic feminist texts. Mm. And because I'm a person for whom, like I said, literature is my religion, I much prefer stories than theory. I don't have a very good relationship with theory. Theory seeks to flatten. Oh, absolutely. You know? And while I can see, I mean, I do see how it can be useful, but in general, and maybe because my, my point of view is very different, I think of, of people. Oh, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. And it's a challenge writing non-fiction, I think, to um, not be dry. Yeah. Well, you, you've succeeded at not being dry. That's just because I was yeah. angry. <laughs> you have. Um, no, but so for me, and that's why I, I, was telling, I was telling you about stage that there's certain words, I, it, there's a certain kind of youthful, social media savvy feminism that isn't my home. I don't, I don't get it, really. And it comes with a kind of jargon that, I, that doesn't feel organic to me. So I don't think I've ever said the word intersectional because I don't even know what it means. <laughs> I know what it meant when Kimberly Cr Crenshaw coined it. And I completely agreed with that definition. But, but I think that it's evolved to mean all kinds of things now. And I, I read this interview some time ago. A, a white actress was asked about feminism. She identifies as feminist. And so she was asked, you know, tell, tell me about feminism. Tell me. And she said, oh, feminism is not about me. It's about all the black women and women of color who've been oppressed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, honestly, there's something about it that really bothered me. And I think, she, and so for her, she said it's intersectionality. So this was her definition of intersectionality. This is not the definition, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a kind of, my, that a kind of, we now all have, we white women, to perform deference to women of color. Mm. I find it hollow. Is this something that you are on the receiving end of, deference? Yes. I don't like it at all. Yeah, I'm also on the receiving end of yeah. it. It's deeply uncomfortable. But also, it's, it's not true. Right? Because feminism is about white women. So I wish that woman had said, here's all the shit I get because I'm a woman. And then imagine I have white privilege and there are women who don't. That I would have been happy with. But yeah. to sort of say, well, you know, it's really about... I just thought, oh, come yeah, Absolutely. On. I think that there's I, been a... Um... And, and I think there's a sense in which the conversation is now about, well, teach me how to say. And I just feel like... <laughs> People need to tell their stories. Their stories mm. don't necessarily have to always fit ideological boxes, you know? Mm. Um, so I think maybe that's why, I, obviously I'm fiercely feminist, but there's certain language that doesn't feel organic to me. There's certain orthodoxy that I don't necessarily abide mm -hmm. by. I'm thinking endlessly of how do we make changes, even if they're incremental. Mm. You know? How do we make sure that women can inherit property in rural areas in Nigeria? How do we make sure that women have access, women have full autonomy to their bodies everywhere in the world? How do we, you know, I'm not interested in academic arguments about, mm. yeah, it just bores me. So, so there's a lot I don't know, mm. right? So sometimes I'll, I'll do interviews and somebody will say to me, well, what was your take on that, on that recent outrage about so-and-so? Then you have to double check and be like, um, and I'm can like, I just look yeah, on Google? Like, let me just Google it for <laughs> yeah, a minute because I don't I even know. <laughs> I get asked about race rounds in fashion, and I'm like, do I look fashionable to you? Like, <laughs> I honestly have no idea what's going on. But I think it's, it's really interesting what you say, because being somebody who came up on the social media wave of feminism, I think it was wildly, hugely rewarding to me. Mm -hmm. At the same time, to me, the purpose of it was to get lots of people thinking critically. It wasn't mm -hmm. to 
create a doctrine that we sort of adhere to. Yeah. And, Wait, and you I think th that's happened? You think people are thinking critically? Well, I don't know anymore because yeah. I don't use it like I once did. <laughs> I'm talking five years ago, six okay. years ago now. Social media isn't the space to, to learn about each other anymore. It's a good space to shout at one another. Yeah, if you say so. Well, <laughs> but do you, do you find that there is a feeling of sometimes needing to please a crowd? Yes. I feel this sometimes. Yes. And I think as a writer, it's very... Yes. It's of utmost important to maintain independent yes. thought. Yes, yes. And, and I fear that social media can be about pleasing a crowd. And, yeah. and I think if the crowd tells me I'm wrong, I hear them, yeah. and I want to know, I want to think about it myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't want yeah. to be told what yeah. to think, you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel exactly the same way. And obviously, I, I mean, even before I had a very interesting taste of um, social media noise, <laughs> I, I always felt uncomfortable with people who, the idea of being shut down, somebody says something, the same way that I feel uncomfortable with people being fired from their jobs for what they've said, I feel that it closes conversation, right? I'd rather that we, we held sort of a large conference to talk about what was said, to point out why it was wrong, if it mm. was wrong. Because then people learn, but there's a kind of close, there's a kind of, this sort of quickness to outrage and quickness to, you know, shut up, you're wrong. And, and, I really think that half the people who are braying on, on the internet don't even know why it's wrong. They couldn't articulate it. There's certainly some bandwagon jumpers out there. But I think there's a lot of it, actually. Mm. And um, so, so some time ago when I said, actually in this country, maybe I should stop doing interviews in, in London. <laughs> so, so this woman said, well, do you think the trans women and women who are born um, uh, female are the same or something like that. And I said, no, I think the experiences are different. And I remember just being shocked by the noise because it seemed to me that I was saying something that was fairly obvious. And I was struck by how it was interpreted to me that I was excluding trans women, that I had created a hierarchy. And it later occurred to me that it really was about language. I hadn't said what you're supposed to say. There's a set language. You're supposed to say trans women are women. And if you don't say that, then you've run afoul of a certain kind of orthodoxy. And I remember thinking, but actually, how do we talk about people's real needs? How do we talk about the needs of trans women if, if somehow their orthodoxy is that it's all the same? Right? So what have you come away from that experience? Um, I've come away thinking that... Reflecting on. So I thought about it for quite a bit. And I just thought, there's a sense in which it's very similar to the, the, the creed of colorblindness, which is ostensibly well-meaning, but I think very dangerous. I think that there's a movement on the progressive left that in the name of being inclusive, we're going to deny difference. And I think that's terrible. I, I mean, what I, what I came away, what I came away, I mean, by turns I felt, I felt very upset. I felt very defensive initially, which by the way also made me feel very um, understanding of white people. Right. <laughs> because it made me understand why. Because I used to think, why are white people always so defensive? Mm. But then I found myself being very defensive. I thought, oh, that's why. Mm. Now I'm behaving like white people. But um, <laughs> no, it, it kind of made me sad because I thought, we can't even have a conversation. You know, we, um, and what's interesting actually is that before this happened, I'd been in Lagos just like four days before. And there's, a, there's a, a man with whom I have these conversations about gender and feminism. And he had really upset me. He came to dinner at my house and he kept insisting on referring to Caitlyn Jenner as he. he. Right. And I was just like, stop it. You know, and he said, it doesn't make sense. And I said, you know what? Call people what they want to be called. It doesn't take anything from you, right? Mm -hmm. And so when all this noise happened a few days later, <laughs> He sent me the most. Oh boy. <laughs> he sent me a text message with emojis that were like. <laughs> oh boy. So, before we go to questions, um, I want to um, plug Janet Mock's memoir. Have you read it? Redefining Realness. Yep. When, when I read her memoir on, on holiday at the end of last year, I realized I had been uh, practicing that color blindness when it came to trans issues. Mm -hmm. I was ready to bleat trans women are women. And, and on reading her memoir, I realized, no, I mean, this is her experience, yeah. first and foremost, but what she's experienced is 
an, an added layer of transphobia that I will never, never. comprehend. Yep. And that book hugely opened my eyes. I'm sounding like a white person. And I realised that... There really were really white people inside. <laughs> <laughs> I realised that just... That I had to acknowledge that difference. Because what, what is, it's not about flattening difference, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but here's the thing, right? There's a sense in which I suppose ostensibly it's a well-meaning idea, mm. but it's a deeply dangerous one because it's the same way that a white person tells you, don't talk about race, we're all the same, we're all human, it's the human race. We but also, you, from Africa, we're all from Africa. Yeah, actually. and you're like, oh, look, look, mm. look at the skull they discovered in, in the Kenyan rift. You know, I mean, so... <laughs> <laughs> when I started, so I, growing up in Nigeria, obviously didn't know very much about trans issues, right? I started reading memoirs of trans women. Actually, the first one I, yeah, I think I read, well, I read one, I read a piece quite early on about, um, you know, the tennis player? I'm going to remember in a minute. I read that early on, and I think that was sort of the first thing that I read. And then later I read memoirs by trans women. I never read theory. Mm. I never read, and I, and I choose not to, because it's important for me to know about the texture of people's lives. And that's when you start, it, it gives you a sort of, entry, right? And you start to understand that, that the violence that trans women um, deal with is a particular kind of violence. I mean, there's a lot of it that it's misogyny, but there's also a lot of it that is rage. How dare you give up on the privilege that you're supposed to have? The, the, part of the, 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 the violence is part of that. And if we don't want to acknowledge it, then you know, I just think it's dishonest. I just think that we, we then don't, are not able to even deal with the problem. So yeah, I, I mean, I, the people who said to me, are you ready to change your mind and recant? And I thought this, what are we in? What is this, like a, a, a now I'm going to be sent off to a re-education camp? I mean, it's ridiculous. Love it. To hear more from WOW 2018, check out the South Bank Centre SoundCloud. And join the conversation on Twitter with hashtag WowLDN.